Welcome to NSG 411, study session 4, functions or components of management, organizing. Introduction. In this study session, we will consider types of healthcare organization and explore through organizational culture and structure. We will also discuss the organizational change, its types and resistance and or receptivity to change. Learning outcomes. When you have studied this session, you should be able to list and explain types of healthcare organization. Examine the concepts of organizational culture and structure. Discuss micro and macro change. Types of healthcare organizations. Although some nurses work as independent practitioners, as consultants, or in the corporate world, most nurses are employed by healthcare organizations. These organizations can be classified into three types on the basis of their sponsorship and financing. 1. Private, not for profit. Many healthcare organizations were founded by civic, charitable, or religious groups. Some have been in existence for generations. Many hospitals long-term care facilities, home care services, and community agencies began this way, although they need money to pay their staff and expenses, they do not have to generate a profit. 2. Publicly supported. Government operated service organizations range from county public health departments to complex medical centers such as those operated by the Veterans Administration, a federal agency. 3. Private for profit. Increasing numbers of healthcare organizations are operated for profit like any other business. These include large hospitals and nursing home chains, health maintenance organizations, and many freestanding centers that provide special services such as surgical and diagnostic centers. Organizational culture. People seek stability, consistency, and meaning in their work. To achieve this, some type of culture will develop within an organization. It is taught often indirectly or unconsciously to new employees as the right way or our way to assess patients' needs, provide care, and relate to fellow caregivers. As with the cultures of societies and communities, it is easy to observe the superficial aspects of an organization's culture, but much of it remains hidden from the casual observer. Elder Skane, a well-known scholar of organizational culture, divided the various aspects of organizational culture into three levels. Artifact level, visible characteristics such as patient's room, layout, patient's record forms, etc., espoused beliefs, stated, often written, goals, philosophy of the organization, underlying assumptions, unconscious but powerful beliefs and feelings, such as a commitment to cure every patient, no matter the cost. Organizational cultures defy a great deal. Some are very traditional, preserving their customary ways of doing things, even when these processes no longer work well. Others, in an attempt to be progressive, chase the newest management fad or buy the latest high technology equipment. Some are warm, friendly, and open to new people and new ideas. Others are cold, defensive, and indifferent or even hostile to the outside world. These very different organizational cultures have a powerful effect on the employees and the people served by the organization. Organizational culture shapes people's behavior, especially their responses to each other which is a particularly important factor in healthcare. Culture of safety. The way in which a healthcare organization's 
operation affect patient safety has been a subject of much discussion. The shared values, attitudes, and behaviors that are directed to preventing or minimizing patient harm have been called the culture of safety. The following are important aspects of an organization's culture of safety. Willingness to acknowledge mistakes. Vigilance in detecting and eliminating error-prone situations. Openness to questioning existing systems and to changing them to prevent errors. Organizational structure. Almost all healthcare organizations have a hierarchical structure of some kind. In a traditional hierarchical structure, employees are ranked from the top to the bottom, as if they were on the steps of a ladder. The number of people on the bottom ranked off the ladder is almost always much greater than the number at the top. The president or CEO is usually at the top of this ladder. The housekeeping and maintenance crews are usually at the bottom. Bureaucracy in organization. Although it seems as if everyone complains about the bureaucracy, not everyone is clear about what a bureaucracy really is. Max Weber defined a bureaucratic organization as having the following characteristics. Division of labor. Specific parts of the job to be done are assigned to different individuals or groups. For example, nurses, physicians, therapists, dietitians, and social workers all provide portions of the health care needed by an individual. Hierarchy. All employees are organized and ranked according to their level of authority within the organization. For example, administrators and directors are at the top of most hospital hierarchies, whereas aides and maintenance workers are at the bottom. Rules and regulations. Acceptable and unacceptable behavior and the power way to carry out various tasks are defined, often in writing. For example, procedure books, policy manuals, bylaws, statements, and memos prescribe many types of behavior, from acceptable isolation techniques to vacation policies. Emphasis on technical competence. People with certain skills and knowledge are hired to carry out specific parts of the total work of the organization. For example, a community mental health center as psychiatrists, social workers, and nurses to provide different kinds of therapies and clerical staff to do the typing and filling. Some bureaucracy is characteristic of the former operation of every organization, even the most deliberately informal, because it promotes smooth operations within a large and complex group of people. Organizational change. Change is a part of everyone's lives. Every day, people have new experiences, meet new people, and learn something new. People grow up, leave home, graduate from college, begin a career, and perhaps start a family. Some of these changes are milestones, ones for which people have prepared and have anticipated for some time. Many are exciting, leading to new opportunities and challenges. Some are entirely unexpected, sometimes welcome and sometimes not. When change occurs too rapidly or demands too much, it can make people uncomfortable, even anxious or stressed. Macro and micro change. The ever whirling wheel of change in healthcare seems to spin faster every year. By itself, managed care profoundly changed the way healthcare is provided in the United States. Medicare and Medicaid courts, increasing numbers of people who are uninsured or underinsured, restructuring, downsizing, and staff shortages are major concerns. 
Such changes sweep through the healthcare system, affecting patients and caregivers alike. They are the macro level, large scale, changes that affect virtually every healthcare facility. Change anywhere in a system creates ripples throughout the system. Every change that occurs at this macro level filters down to the micro level, small scale change to teams and to individuals. Nurses, colleagues in other disciplines and patients are participants in these changes. Resistance to change. People resist change for a variety of reasons that vary from person to person and situation to situation. You might find that one patient care technician is delighted with an increase in responsibility Whereas another is upset about it. Some people are eager to risk change, others prefer the status quo. Managers may find that one change in routine provokes a storm of protest and that another is hardly noticed. Resistance to change comes from three major sources, technical concerns, psychosocial needs and threat to a person's position and power. Active and passive. Attacking the idea. Passive. Avoiding discussion. Active. Refusing to change. Passive. Ignoring the change. Arguing against the change. Passive. Refusing to commit to the change. Active. Organizing resistance. Passive. Agreeing but not acting of other people. Receptivity to change. Recognizing different information processing styles. An interesting research study suggests that nurse managers are more receptive to change than their staff members. Nurse managers were found to be more innovative and decisive, whereas staff nurses preferred proven approaches, thus being resistant to change. Nursing assistants, unit secretaries, and licensed practical nurses were also unreceptive to change, adding layers of people who formed a solid wall of resistance to change. Helping teams recognize their preference for certainty as opposed to change will increase their receptivity to necessary changes in the workplace. Speaking to people's feelings, although both thinking and feeling responses to change are important, the art of change lies in the emotions surrounding it. The following are some examples of appeals to feelings. Instead of presenting statistics about the number of people who are readmitted due to poor discharge preparation, providing a story is more persuasive. An older man collapsed at home the evening after discharge because he had not been able to control his diabetes post-surgery. Trying to break his fall, he fractured both wrists and is now unable to return home or take care of himself. Even better, videotape an interview with this man, letting him tell his story and describe the repercussions of poor preparation for discharge. 3. Drama may also be achieved through visual display. A culture plate of pathogens grown from swabs of ventilator, equipment, and patient's room furniture is more attention-getting than an infection control report. A display of disposables with price tags attached used for just one surgical patient is more memorable than an accounting sheet listing the cost. Phases of planned change. Designing the change. Plan implementation. Implement the change. Integrate the change. Myth about changing behavior. Crisis is a powerful impetus for change. 90% of patients who have had coronary bypasses do not sustain changes in the unhealthy lifestyles, which worsens their severe health disease and greatly threatens their lives. Change is motivated by fear. It is too easy for people to go into denial of the bad things that might happen to them. Companion positive visions of the future 
are a much stronger inspiration for change. The facts will set us free. Our thinking is guided by narratives, not facts. When a fact does not fit people's conceptual frames, the metaphors used to make sense of the world, people reject the fact. Also, change is best inspired by emotional appeals rather than factual statements. Small, gradual changes are always easier to sustain. Radical, sweeping changes are often easier because they yield benefits make and quickly. People cannot change because the brain becomes hardwired early in life. Brains have extraordinary plasticity, meaning that people can continue learning complex new things throughout life, assuming they remain truly active and engaged. Study session summary. In this study session, we considered types of healthcare organization and explored true organizational culture and structure. We also discussed the organizational change, its types and resistance and or receptivity to change. End of study session 4.